I'm blind without this. Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody here. And the pews are filling up. I hope you're doing the call to worship. Um, people of faith, let us gather together in this holy time of worship to rest from our work, giving thanks and praise to God. People of faith, let us gather here in this holy place to hear the word, to share God's love, and to confirm our calling. People of faith, now is the time for worship. Thank you. church. It's wonderful to see us start to fill up again. I'm going to do today's uh, scripture lesson and prayer. It's from Job 19, 25 through 27. I know that my, my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Can we pray? Thank you, Lord, for this time and for the assurance that living in your light is not filled with guilt or drudgery, but joy from a cleansed heart. 
Lord, I ask you to be with your children and help us forget the burden of our past. Please be with the unfortunate, those living without the sight of a bright future, those drowning in addiction and despair brought on by sin, just as I am. For your glory, Lord. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you. It's also known as, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. It's a beautiful song. You know, we don't, we hear it and sometimes we sing the words, sometimes we don't. Perhaps we don't even know all the words. So I thought I would share with you the four verses and just listen closely to these, to these words. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built in him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence. By the dim and flaring lamps, his day is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. And you know the chorus. Glory, glory, 
Hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we think of these words, your glory is marching on. May we feel your glory in this room this morning as we open your word. Speak to us. Use me, Lord, to deliver what it is you want us to know about you. And may we leave here differently than when we arrived. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This country was in the midst of that terrible civil war between the North and the South. And deeply anguished at this growing conflict between the two sectors of the country. There was a remarkable woman by the name of Julia Ward Howe. And she proclaimed her confidence in God's triumphant power in the inspiring words that I just read to you and the music that you heard. Now she was born into a wealthy family, New York City in the year 1819. She descended from Roger Williams and two governors of Rhode Island. And she mixed with such luminaries in the social circles, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Charles Dickens, Samuel Clemens, Mike, Mark Twain, counted himself as her friend. The year was 1843 when she married Samuel Gridley Howe. He was 18 years her senior. He was a very autocratic husband. He sharply limited her activities. He took charge of her money, which he, he managed ruinously. And when he died in 1876, she wrote in her diary, Start my new life today. She used her writing and speaking skills to promote a number of causes to include women's rights, education reform, the abolition of slavery. 1861, she traveled to Washington, D.C., where she met with President Abraham Lincoln at the White House. Now, she had also visited a Union Army camp, and that's where she heard the, the soldiers singing, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. It's a song honoring John Brown. He was a, a prominent abolitionist who had been hanged for treason against the state of Virginia in 1859. Now, her pastor at the time, the Reverend James Freeman Clark, he asked her to consider writing new words to that tune. And that night in her hotel room, the words came to her mind as she tried to sleep, and, and she got up and hastily wrote them down on an old piece of paper. And then she offered her poem to the Atlantic Monthly Magazine, which they published it in 1862, and they sent her a check for $5. Now, Chaplain C.C. C. McCabe of the Union Army, he heard the song. And he began to teach it to the soldiers in his command. But then it soon spread to soldiers and other units, and, and finally to the ordinary citizens of the United States. It became incredibly popular, made Julia Howe famous, and we heard it today. But as you think of those words, the words in that song are couched in the language of Christ's second coming. A time when Christ will sift out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. And her words, grapes of wrath, in that first verse, they allude to that passage here in Revelation 14, 19, which speaks of the great winepress of the wrath of God. But then Hal's mention of the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. That alludes to the trumpets of Revelation 8, where seven angels, seven trumpets. However, that phrase that spoke loudly to the, to the soldiers who in the confusion of battle, they received their commands from trumpet sounds. A trumpet that shall never sound retreat. That was an inspiring image for those soldiers. And to this day, Howe's song,
continues to enjoy great popularity. Lyndon Johnson had it sung at his inauguration back in 1965. Andy Williams sang the song at Robert Kennedy's funeral in 1968. But perhaps the, the best story of all comes from James Humes, who was a presidential speechwriter. And one day he was interviewing General Eisenhower. A few weeks after Winston Churchill's, Churchill's funeral in 1965. And he asked Eisenhower to talk about the most moving moment of that funeral. And Eisenhower mentioned this song. He noted that Churchill had learned this song at his American mother's knee, and it was one of his favorites. And Eisenhower says, you know, we all know that first verse, mine eyes have seen the glory. But do you know the third verse, he asked. And he said, because there I was seated with the heads of state, Charles de Gaulle of France, Queen Juliana of the Netherlands, King Olaf of Norway, King Baudouin of Belgium, these heads of nations of freedom, get this, heads of nations whose freedom had been redeemed by the very warrior who lay in state just a few feet away. And Eisenhower says, and I could see feelings of gratitude and reverence miss their eyes as they did my own as we all sang that third verse. He sounded forth the trumpet that never called retreat. His will goes marching on. It's quite a story. I had read this a number of months ago, and we were still in the book of Acts, so I wasn't going to take time for departing from that series, but I had asked Martha Jean if she would learn to play that sometime for us on the organ, and I wasn't expecting a piano and organ duet. This is fantastic. But as I read the story, and you think about Julia and how she had walked through the Union encampments during the Civil War. And what she must have felt, that she could see the glory of the Lord as she walked through those camps, those armies, armies of men who were trying to set men free. And you think about, wow, to have such implicit trust in God's faithful care and protection, it's never easy in times of danger or strife, is it? But it's in this song that the writer of the words mentions, she mentions what? Seeing the glory of the Lord. Seeing the glory of the Lord where? In his judgment. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Think about the coming glory of the Lord. The glory of the coming Lord. Think about that. Think about the glory of God. Think about God revealing his glory to us. And it's interesting to note that all of the different ways in scripture in which God reveals himself. And as I was studying for this, there's a lot of really interesting Bible stories, Bible passages. We, we know many of them. When God reveals himself in a special manifestation the glory of the Lord. Many examples. One in particular, a story we all know well, is the way God made his appearance known to the Israelites when they were traveling, running from Pharaoh through the desert. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22, we read, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. And neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. What an awesome sight that must have been. What an experience to have a pillar of cloud leading you from place to place during the day and then turning into this pillar of fire at night, dark on one side, bright on the other. What an awesome sight. And then you think about when Jesus led Peter, James, and John up a high mountain. 
And all of a sudden, Jesus' face and even his clothes, they start to shine like lightning. And then what happens? A cloud envelops them, and the Lord speaks to them. What a sight. We can go back into the Old Testament, and we can look at God's word in the book of Exodus. Here's Moses. He had this opportunity to go directly into the presence of the Lord and receive the Ten Commandments directly from God as he put them on these tablets of stone. And the glory of the Lord was so obvious, so glorious, that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was so bright that it scared the Israelites. Now as we think back on all these examples of of God giving a great and glorious vision of himself, it's hard for us to envision, isn't it? I mean, we think, if God would just appear to me like that, oh, I would be so encouraged, I'd be so ready to serve him if he would just do that. And I wouldn't worry so much about life. And at times we even ask, Lord, where's my burning bush? Where is my vision of your glory? Where is it? Let me see something. Because that's the way we are. We want visuals. We want to see something. We want to see the spirit in action. We have a certain expectation of seeing. When we attend church and the songs that we sing and the sermon the preacher preaches. And you know, we've just had 14, 15 months of being online and it's been a great experience. But it's different being in the same room. But I submit to you that there is not a one of us who can say that we have not seen the glory of God. And if we haven't seen the glory of God, then the problem is poor eyesight. The problem is we're not looking in the right places. Think about when the Lord appeared to Elijah. He didn't come in an earthquake or a mighty tornado. He appeared in a whisper. Now we just finished a series on the book of Acts, so think back to Acts 2, verse 38. And God says that when you are baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you are baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say that the Spirit comes to us in a tongue of fire as they saw then, but in water, a simple substance. Not much flash to that, is there? But you think about it. Here's God himself. He descends from heaven. He reveals himself in his word in the simple water of baptism. Now, how often do we overlook the glory of God in the simple things of life? Think about bookshelves at home and Bibles, how they might stack up. Think about my desk at the office. There's like five of them piled up there, different versions. It's the word of God in there. You drive by a mountain, mountainside, the glory of God. Wonders of a new babe born. At times it's like there's a veil over our faces and we just can't see the glory of God right there in front of us. And Paul, he emphasizes this point in his second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 11. He writes, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, if it came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? And if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Do you notice what Paul just said there to us? He says... We have more glorious sights than Moses did. We have more glorious sights than Moses did. Why? Because we are now living under the ministry of the gospel. 
We're living under the good news of Jesus Christ. You think about how much more we have than those that lived in the Old Testament times. We know who the Christ is. We know what he did. We're living under the freedom of knowing that Jesus has given us salvation through his blood. We aren't living under the ministry of the law that only condemns us. Then you think about how much more we have than those early New Testament believers that we have studied about, that early church. How much more we have than those early those early believers. We all have the word of God. And it's nicely assembled and, and sitting here in our fingertips in the Bible. But we feel sometimes that we are lacking something because God doesn't appear to us in a pillar of fire or on a mountaintop. But thank God that Jesus died for our bad eyesight, that he replaced our eyesight. He gave us new eyes of faith, enabling us to see the glory of his forgiveness. Now that we know that God reveals himself in different ways in different places, did you ever wonder why he doesn't appear to us as he did to Moses or Elijah or the Israelites? Ever thought ever cross your mind? Why did they get such visual appearances of God and we don't? Seems like a good question. So let's take a moment. Let's look at the background of when and why God appeared and why he showed his glory the way that he did and when he did. Think back to when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. That was a crucial point in Moses' life and the life of the Israelites. They'd been under the oppression of the Egyptians. They'd been crying out for help well over 80 years. And it was at this period in time that God decided to call Moses to lead the Israelites out of bondage into the promised land. So here's two million people about to leave captivity, going to be traveling through the wilderness, out through the desert. And what was worse, they're going to have this Egyptian army following them, running after them. How would they be able to survive? And God described what his presence did for them. He says, the pillar of cloud moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. But then throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night long. Then back to when Jesus transfigured before the disciples. Think about Peter, James, and John. Think about what was to happen, what they were about to see. These very leaders of the church were about to see the man that they believed was the Messiah, the chosen one. They're about to see him arrested, mocked, crucified. The hope of Israel, gone. What a trying period that would have been for them. And how about when Moses found the Israelites worshiping the golden calf, the bottom of Mount Sinai. And now Moses has to lead those people into the desert, in the danger from other countries, and on the way to the promised land. And Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And it was at this time, and this trying point in Moses' life, that God appeared to Moses and he showed Moses that he's this compassionate and gracious God. And then God proceeded to give Moses the Ten Commandments right there on top of Mount Sinai in his very presence. So if you look at all these instances that we're talking about here, where God would give his disciples a glorious vision of his presence, what is the common thread that's running through all of them? What's the common thread? You see, in every instance, the people of God were about to face a very difficult situation. In order to give them extra courage and comfort to make it through, God gave them a special vision of himself. 
those disciples, they were able to look back on that transfiguration after Jesus had been crucified and remember that Jesus really was God. Moses was able to lead the Israelites out of the desert, which God assured him of his divine presence. And in spite of that, they would easily fall away from God's grace. They would forget that the Savior was to be born. They went into the desert. They went into the promised land. And they could, and they began to turn away from God. And so God had Moses go up and receive the Ten Commandments. And Moses came back down with that glowing face. That was to send a message to the Israelites that I am God. You are sinful. You need a savior. God wanted to impress them with his holiness so that they would fear him and look forward to the coming Messiah. And that's why Moses covered his face when the glory started fading. God didn't want them to think that God wasn't serious about the law. Just imagine if they had seen Moses' face get dim, they perhaps would not have been as impressed with the law. But it all goes to show that God showed his glory to encourage his people during the difficult, trying times that they were going through or headed into. And it worked. God's glorious law was able to keep some of the Israelites humble and prepare them for the Savior. Notice I said some of them. Now, if it's true that we have a more glorious vision of God than the Israelites did, who were given the vision of Moses' face in Mount Sinai, what does that tell us? What does it tell us if we have a more glorious vision? With the glory of the gospel having been revealed to us, we must have a more difficult chore ahead of us. And then you wonder, what does God have in store for us? How many times have we asked that question over the last five, six years in this church? What does God have in store for us? We're going into a desert? Hopefully not. But you know, you look at Matthew 24, 25, God did reveal, Jesus revealed some of the things that we will go through. And he says we'll be living during and through famines and earthquakes and pestilence. What have we just lived through? What are we living through? False prophets will abound. And the love of many grows cold and many fall away. And we see that. And he says that as the end nears, things will only get worse. And I believe we are living in those times. So how are we to go through the difficult times ahead? What did God do for Moses with the difficult times ahead of him? He assured Moses of his presence. Isn't that what we need to do as well today? When we face difficult times in our lives, it is at that time more than ever that we need to listen to God's word. And that will give us the assurance of God's presence. God's presence in our lives and he is still with us. It will give us the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil. James 4, I'm sorry, James 5, verses 8. James encourages us, you too, you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Let me ask you a question now. What is the most incredible thing that you've seen in your life? What is the most incredible thing that you've experienced in your life where God was present? Think about it. A number of things go through my mind and my own life. 
Perhaps there was an accident that could have happened, but didn't. Perhaps it did and your life was spared. Well, I can tell you today what is the most incredible thing that you have seen. I can tell you what that is. Now, I would like to say that it's the fact that you are sitting here listening to the sermon. But the most incredible thing that has happened to you is while you're sitting here listening to the sermon. Because right now, you are seeing through the eyes of faith that Jesus is the true God and Savior of the world. And you know, when you see that, your eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And with that glory of the Lord before your eyes, you can face whatever God allows to happen to you. And most importantly, you can say with Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. Our scripture reading. And then in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. You know, the battle hymn, it's the favorite of many. It was a favorite of Walt Disney, so much so that it was played at the end of his private funeral back in 1966. I'll always share with you, but it was one of Winston Churchill's favorite songs. It was played at his state funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral. It's been performed at many other memorial services. Most notably would have been the service at St. Paul's Cathedral for those lives lost because of 9-11. There was the Requiem Mass for Bobby Kennedy, Senator John McCain's funeral at Washington National Cathedral. And perhaps the one that I found most interesting in my study, in the opening lines were the last words spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. On April 3, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He gave a speech in support of sanitation workers in Memphis. And he announced, as that speech was coming to a close, he announced, I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight, and I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. And his last words were, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The next day, he was assassinated on the second floor of the Lorraine Motel. And I'll conclude with this question to you. Can you say those words right now? The first line of that hymn, My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we contemplate your glory, we think of all the ways that you showed your glory to those in times of years gone by, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And we're encouraged that you do show your glory. And you want to show your glory to us. You don't show it in the same way that we've seen, that we've read about here. But your glory is visible and we just have to look for it in the right places. We have to look for it in your word. And you will give us all the encouragement we need for the difficult road ahead of us. And Lord, as we leave this place today, 
as we go throughout our week. May we remember the words, the first line of that song. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Because that's all that matters. We have seen the coming glory. Lord, now as we, as we conclude our service, may we remember those words and we, may we remember everything you've done for us. And Lord, we just ask, come quickly, that's all. We pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. we leave here today I like the summary I gave a couple weeks ago in Acts and I just want you to remember these words along with what we've just been talking about here just remember the Savior went up the Spirit came down the church went out the lost came in the church is still to go out and the lost will still come in we're glad that the recorders are with us today